accountable. Thank you, Mr. President. Questions. Question number one, Mr. Chen Han Pen. President. The authorities have started the Tongchong New Town Development Extension Study and various large-scale infrastructure projects on Northland Town, such as the Hong Kong Boundary Crossing Facilities of the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, Hong Kong Link Road, and the Tun Moon Chek Club Cock Link have commenced one after another. Some civil organizations have pointed out that on the premise of striking a balance between conservation and development, the authorities should improve the internal external transport links of Lantau Island, make good use of port facilities there to develop bridge head economy, developed Tung Chung into a new town with local characteristics which is suitable for living, doing business, working, sightseeing and schooling and promote the economic development of Hong Kong by capitalizing on the synergy generated by the North Lantau development. In this connection, will government inform this council? A. As there are views that the traffic flows between the urban areas and Lantau Island will increase substantially upon the commissioning of the bridge, of the details of the plans drawn up by the authorities for improving the road networks concerned and how future vehicle flows into Hong Kong through the bridge will be diverted to avoid traffic congestion in areas around Tong Chong. B. Given that the artificial island for the uh, HKBCF will have an area of up to 150 hectares. Whether the authorities will, apart from the provision of cross-boundary facilities, build other facilities including car parks, shopping malls and hotels, etc. on the island, if they were of the details, if not the reasons for that. C. Given that the authorities have indicated that they will consider providing additional conference and exhibition facilities, hotels, shopping malls and sightseeing attractions on Lantau Island to receive visitors coming to Hong Kong through the bridge. What specific plans do authorities have for developing bridgehead economy? Whether they have plans to establish an interdepartmental organization such as the Lantau Island Development Committee to coordinate the relevant work of various departments so as to avoid a situation of a lack of coordination among the partners of sort of details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Development. President, members, good morning. According to the CE's 2013 policy address, Lantau Island, in particular Tung Chung, has a geographical advantage for the development of logistics, tourism and other industries, as well as um, um, the creation of employment opportunities for the local residents. Such development is further facilitated by the progressive implementation of a number of major infrastructure projects like the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge and the Twin Moon Chalap Kok Lake. In 2007, the government published the concept plan for Lantau and the overall planning approach is to optimize the use of internal external transport links and infrastructure, concentrate the development in Lantau and create business and employment opportunities whilst protecting the rural natural environment of scenic and high ecological value in Lantau for nature conservation and um, visitor use. To fully capitalize on the strategic location of Tung Chong and tie in with the concept plan for Lantau, we are conducting the Tung Chong New Town Development Extension Study with a view to developing Tung Chong into a more sizable and comprehensively developed new town. We are also exploring the reclamation potential of Siu Ho Wan and Sunny Bay in the Enhancing Land Supply Strategy Study for increasing the land available for development in Lantau. And in parallel, we will continue to explore in earnest the development potential of Lantau and areas along the trunk routes in NT West. Examples include Tung Moon areas 40 and 46 adjacent to the landing point of the Tun Moon Chuk Lap Kong Lake, which have great development potential. We've commenced relevant planning and engineering studies for a comprehensive replanning of the land uses in these two areas. To give full play to the benefit of the bridge and facilitating the bridgehead economy in nearby areas, the Transport and Housing Bureau plans to provide convenient public transport services between the Hong Kong boundary crossing facilities of the bridge and the Hong Kong International Airport, Tong Chong, other parts of the land, Tao Island and Chun Moon. Our aim is to develop the uh, HKBCF 
of the bridge into a strategic transportation hub of the west of Hong Kong, with a view to providing facilitation to travellers coming to Hong Kong through the bridge to make use of the commercial and tourism facilities in the local areas, including North Lantau, and thereby creating business and employment opportunities. We are also considering future expansion programs of the HKIA, including the three runway system. The AA Airport Authority is conducting a development strategy study on the North Commercial District of the um, Airport Island. On the basis of the information provided by the THB, my reply to the three part question is as follows A. The bridge is scheduled for opening in late 2016. To prepare for the commissioning of the bridge, corresponding planning has been made for the overall transport network to cope with any increased vehicle traffic. The related road planning design includes the new Tumun Chalapkok link with its southern section connecting the HKBCF of the bridge and North Lantau Highway by way of a viaduct. This section will be commissioned simultaneously with the bridge. By then, vehicles travelling between the HKBCF of the bridge and the urban areas or the NT can route through this viaduct direct instead of going through the roads in the Tung Chong area. The northern section of the Tun Mun Chuk Up Kok link, which will connect the uh, HKBCF of the bridge with Tun Mun in the form of a subsea tunnel, is scheduled for commissioning in late 2018. Upon its completion, the traffic between areas of Northwest NT and the HKBCF of the bridge and lens how including the uh, airport, can make direct use of the subsea tunnel. The Twin Moon Chuk Upcock link will serve the purpose of traffic diversion, helping to alleviate the traffic load of North Lantau Highway, Lantau Link and Twin Moon Highway. Furthermore, new roads connecting the HKBCF of the bridge and the adjacent International Airport are also included in the relevant road planning design in order to facilitate visitors travelling. B. The government is building the HKBCF of the bridge by reclamation in waters off the northeast of the International Airport. About 150 hectares of land will be developed in the entire project for accommodating boundary crossing and transport facilities of the bridge. Among them, the passenger terminal building to be constructed will provide commercial facilities like restaurants, duty-free shops, convenience stores, money exchange, um, electronic teller machines, etc. to facilitate visitors. Currently, the HKBCF of the bridge project does not include any sizable shopping malls or hotels. However, we understand that Mr. Chan and the public wish to tap the economic potential arising from the HKBCF artificial island. In this connection, we'll give full consideration to options for capitalizing on the opportunities brought by the artificial island and the bridge after its opening, so long as such options do not affect target commissioning of the bridge by the end of 2016. As mentioned above, we've launched a series of development projects in order to give full play to the benefit of the bridge and the HKBCF in facilitating the bridgehead economy in North Lantau and the nearby areas. Like all development and infrastructure projects, the policy bureaus and departments concerned in the government will maintain close liaison to jointly work out the overall development plan for Lantau. There is well-established mechanisms within the government for coordinating all such development planning and projects. The steering committee on land supply chaired by the FS will also coordinate the work of the bureaus and departments relating to the overall development and supply of land. Thank you, President. Mr. Chen Hangpan. President, in order that there can be development of land Tao, the residents hope that um, the government can make the best use of the opportunities available. Uh, and Lantau has its unique features, and I think strategic planning is required to give play to the potential of Lantau. And there should be planning in terms of transport, tourism facilities, and so on and so forth. So can the steering committee on land supply coordinate all these matters? Can the steering committee substitute the interdepartmental mechanism mentioned in the policy address to um, coordinate the development of Lantau. Secretary, 
President, um, uh, with regard to the steering committee chaired by the financial secretary, it's true that it can't take up all the work mentioned by Mr. Chen Hangpan just now. But then, all policy bureaus and departments are maintained close liaison concerning the development of land. How we are working jointly on this um, initiative, and it's um, the CE is, is also involved in such discussions, and he is um, giving instructions. So we do have a coordinating mechanism to uh, consider the various issues um, on uh, planning and development. Uh, is it that your question has not been answered? President, my question has not been answered. Now, in his election manifesto, the uh, CE said that there should be an interdepartmental organization comprising government representatives, the business sector, and the public. And we haven't seen um, this mechanism set up yet is it that the steering committee can substitute this mechanism. Secretary, um, President, the steering committee can't play the role of um, such a mechanism. But as I have said just now, different departments and bureaus are coordinating uh, development and planning matters in relation to Lan Tao. And at the next stage, we will take into account um, the progress achieved and we will decide on um, the best mechanism um, to be in charge of, of the project. Mr. Albert Chen, of course we all want to see development precedent, but then it's important that we take into account the impact on people's livelihood and health. Now in Tongchong, there are two um, disasters, one air pollution the second aircraft noise. I think the secretary should know that um, at noon time, um, the air pollution in Tongchong is uh, the most serious um, in the territory, and there are a lot of um, um, suspended particulates. So, with regard to um, growth in uh, vehicular traffic, resulting in um, more air pollution, uh, causing adverse impact on people's health and endangering people's lives. Um, I think uh, the government um, must not um, pursue development at the expense of the health of the residents of Tongchong. Secretary, thank you, President. I thank Mr. Chen for his question and his reminder. In fact, when we um, carry out the um, Tongchong New Town Extension Study, we are considering developing Tongchong East and Tongchong West. Now, in fact, according to the initial planning, there would be a reclamation and the population will be about 200,000. At the moment, the population stands at about 90,000. And uh, we understand that in terms of employment opportunities, um, public transport, um, the situation is not that satisfactory. And so we hope to further expand the Tongchong New Town. And uh, the um, total population should uh, be uh, about um, 200,000 or more. And that would uh, mean economy of scale with regard to improvements to public transport and other aspects. Concerning air quality and noise, um, uh, air pollution and noise pollution, of course, we do take this into account. This is an interdepartmental initiative. And the Environment Bureau is also heavily involved in exercise that gives us input. And in the planning process, there will be assessments on the um, impact on air quality. Ms. Starry Lee. Now, uh, major enterprises and district organizations on Lantau have set up the uh, Alliance on Lantau Development. The Alliance has given uh, a lot of uh, suggestions and views on the development of Lantau, and they've uh, come up with a planning paper. They are of the view that a Lantau planning committee should be set up. They hope that they can uh, jointly um, discuss the uh, planning of um, um, Lenta with the government, they hope to take part in the planning process. And so uh, will there be a platform set up for uh, the government, the business sector and the public to hold discussions on uh, the development of Lens How? If the um, answer is no, how can you make sure that such communication, tripartite communication can be done? Um, President, thank you very much. In, re in my reply to Mr. Chan, I already said that uh, there are studies going on on an inter- Bureau uh, interdepartmental level. Before we come to the actual land use planning, we need to consider infrastructural planning, transport, air quality, and so on and so forth. We have to lay the groundwork and we need to um, take a macro view um, of um, the whole area. Now concerning the committee set up 
by um, the residents of Lanzhou. I want to say that we do appreciate the work this committee has done and the views it has given us. We have noted their uh, wishes and uh, also um, we always bear in mind the um, plans outlined in the policy address and we will be making a decision in the next stage of planning. Thank you. Mr. Gary Fan. Thank you, President. Now concerning the Twin Moon uh, Chat Club Kong Lake and the Twin Moon West Bypass, uh, which should be commissioned in 2016, there will be a delay of two years. In other words, uh, these two can't be commissioned um, when the uh, bridge is commissioned uh, at the end of 2016. So um, uh, I would like to know what the government um, is going to do do um, to solve the problems caused by the commissioning of the bridge and all the, all the problems to be experienced during the transitional period. Uh, President, thank you. Now, because of the judicial uh, review and other reasons, uh, the projects have been delayed. But it is not that the entire Twin Moon Chak Lap Kong Link project has been delayed. Now, concerning the southern portion, uh, this is the airport island, uh, concerning Lantau North, that section will be commissioned when the bridge is commissioned. So when uh, the vehicles and the people come in, they can go to the urban area or other parts of the NT through North Lantau. But concerning the northern section landing in Tun Moon, it's true that um, for that link, there is some delay. And we understand that concerning the landing, the, the bypass um, um, on the western side, um, there are certain problems. And I hope that the residents can take into account the uh, overall needs of um, the community. And so we hope that we can get more support concerning the uh, western bypass of the link so that um, this um, link can be commissioned as soon as possible. Mr. Tam Yu Chong, President, may I refer to paragraph three of the um, main reply? It is said that the airport authority is now looking at the um, this, uh, development strategy uh, of the North um, Commercial District. Now, may I refer to paragraph eighty-three of the twenty thirteen policy address? It is said that um, um, development in the North Commercial District will be taken forward. But then we've heard recently that within the AA, um, there is no consensus concerning um, such development. We want to know what the controversy is, the progress achieved so far. And also concerning the 11 hectare site now used as um, um, a temporary golf course, how are you going to make use of this formed site? Secretary, President, I want to say that um, uh, uh, a lot of the elements uh, um, in the um, report uh, uh, were speculative in nature, and so I won't comment on that report. But it's true that um, this site is um, a precious um, formed site, and it's worth developing it as soon as possible. We need more job opportunities on Lantau. And also, given the tight supply of land in Hong Kong, such land can help to um, alleviate the shortage. I understand that the AA has commissioned a consultant to carry out a study, and uh, the study uh, should be completed before the end of this year. The THB and the AA are liaising very closely on the various options. I believe... Uh, and an, um, uh, more detailed information will be made available in due course. Mr. Leung Chi Cheng, President, the CE often says that in terms of um, district planning, the planning department should plan with the um, district organizations and should um, get more input from the district organizations. But then concerning um, the planning for Lantau, it seems that... Um, um, the administration um, is not engaging the district council um, adequately. Mm. 
the district council has been complaining that a lot of roads on the uh, uh, Lantau Island are extremely dangerous because they are very narrow. They have been asking for improvement, but then um, uh, uh, um, little progress has been achieved in this regard. So can the secretary tell us um, about his view on uh, these badly needed uh, improvement measures? Secretary, President, thank you. We are most willing to... Um, I have more meetings um, and to communicate more with the district council and other local um, representatives concerning the development of lands. How uh, we understand that um, the public uh, want to see more development on North Lands and other parts of Lands. How, but of course. Um, Traffic and transport is a major constraint. And then as to what we can uh, do um, uh, on, uh, on the, the, the roads, uh, I think, um, yes, we can um, look at these um, roads in a targeted manner. But then um, in South Lands How, there are uh, a lot of protected areas and uh, conservation areas. And so there can't be um, the very large scale developments. And um, that, that would, of course, affect the uh, public transport infrastructure that can be provided. But of course, if members um, have particular views on certain roles or certain sections of certain roles, we're willing to um, have further discussions of them. But all in all, the THB uh, is fully aware of the um, <coughs> Demands um, in the district. Ms. Ellis Mack, yes, uh, President, may I refer to part two of the reply? It is said that um, the um, artificial island, um, for the artificial island, there is no planning for major uh, shopping malls or hotels. But then I want to say that in order to develop the economic effectiveness of the area, it is not that the only way to achieve that is to build sizable shopping malls or hotels. Now, some people are saying that uh, for those um, um, living on Lantau Island, they are all um, uh, working uh, for or serving the large enterprises. So in developing that area, how can you make sure that jobs can be provided and that um, the residents' views will be taken into account and that small operators will have uh, room for um, survival. Secretary, now um, concerning the bridge, um, uh, and there's a um, section in question. Uh, this is reclaimed land uh, and um, we understand that the airport is nearby and also it was agreed that the scale of reclamation should be kept to a minimum. Now the facilities there will uh, mainly uh, be uh, uh, for the um, the tourists and the visitors, as I've stated in my main reply. But then, when the bridge is commissioned, there will be enhanced links between Hong Kong and the western part of the PRD, Tianhai, uh, Zhongshan, uh, Hangqin, Macau. They are all on the western side, and so. Um, People flow and vehicle flow uh, will definitely increase. In the past year or two, there were um, discussions in Hong Kong uh, on the impact uh, on uh, Hong Kong people's livelihood caused by the shopping activities of um, uh, mainland tourists coming on the individual uh, travelers' scheme. And so it was suggested that um, some shopping facilities should be provided uh, outside the urban areas um, so that um, the um, um, uh, visitors uh, would not have to um, or go to the urban area for shopping. Now, President, in fact, in Tongchong, um, the residents are saying that there aren't enough job opportunities. We want to extend the Tongchong New Town. We want to um, provide more jobs. We want to provide... Uh, more railway stations and other public transport facilities. Um, the objective is to um, make Tong Chong a um, new town which is uh, full of vitality. So we are actively studying the um, development options for Tong Chong. 
and of course. And the planning process we will be liaising very closely with the um, Land Tao Planning Committee. So we want to develop bridgehead economy. We want to provide more job opportunities for the residents of Tong Chong so that they will not have to uh, travel to other districts to work. We've spent over 25 minutes on this one. Next question. Mr. Raymond Chen Chi Chun. Thank you, Chairman. It has been reported that the Air Traffic Control Center of the Civil Aviation Department and the 999 reporting centers of the Hong Kong Police Force had separately procured more than 100 office chairs of well-known brands, and the retail prices of the chairs range from $8,000 to $10,000 each, with a total value exceeding $1 million. The authorities explained that the procurement of expensive chairs was for the purpose of allowing the staff to concentrate on their work. However, notwithstanding the fact that counter staff of the Immigration Department and the Immigration Control Points need to sit for long hours at work as well, their chairs cost less than $900 each. Regarding the criteria and requirements, requirements governing the procurement of office furniture and other stores by government departments, will the government inform this council A of the details of the chairs currently used by the staff of reporting centers and counter staff of control points respectively, including brand names, model numbers, quantities and unit prices? And the reasons for the department's concern to procure chairs that vary greatly in price. B. Apart from the requirement to comply with the stores and procurement regulations of the relevant factors that government departments may consider in procuring stores and how the question of whether staff members can concentrate on their work is related to the price of chairs. And C. Given that the regulations stipulate that procurement of stores and services exceeding $1.43 million in value by policy bureau and government departments must be done by the use of open and competitive tendering procedures so as to obtain the best value for money, whether the government has pro formulated procurement rules for stores of total value less than $1.43 million but with high unit prices, if it has of the details, if not how it regulates government departments' procurement of stores with unit prices which are beyond a reasonable level whether the government has put in place practicable measures to guard against government departments circumventing the procurement requirement of open and competitive tendering procedures for stores and services with total value exceeding $1.43 million by procuring them in batches. The Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury. Mr. President, first of all, I will give a brief account of the government procurement policy and the established procedures for the procurement of furniture. At present, Standard furniture of bureaus and departments, uh, hereafter referred to as departments, is normally supplied by the Government Logistics Department, GLD, and the Correctional Services Industries, or CSI. GLD arranges various bulk procurement contracts for departments. Items procured include office chairs and steel filing cabinets. The CSI is responsible for the supply of standard wooden furniture office furniture, such as desks and computer tables. If departments have to use non-standard furniture due to operational needs, they are required to follow the government's store and procurement regulations, or SPR. Generally speaking, goods with a total value of over $1.43 million must be procured through open tender. Departments should invite at least five written quotations for purchases with a value over $50,000 but not exceeding $1.43 million. And at least two quotations for purchases with a value not exceeding $50,000. In all cases, departments must conduct procurement exercises in accordance with the principles of open and fair competition to ensure that the goods purchased are reasonably priced and are value for money. Departments should normally accept the lowest conforming offer and can only accept a higher conforming order under exceptional circumstances with full justifications. My reply to the three-part question raised by Mr. Honorable Chan is as follows. A. According to the information from departments concerned, there are a total of about 
240 chairs for use by police communications officers in the 3999 reporting centers of the police force. All the chairs are model Aaron of the brand Herman Miller. Each chair costs about $4,300 on average. In the case of the immigration department, there are now 12 control points provided with a total of about 600 chairs, excluding those at the Hong Kong International Airport Control Point, which are provided by the Airport Authority of Hong Kong for use by counter staff. Since the counter chairs at the control points were procured at different points in time, they are of different brands and models. At present, the most common ones in use are the U273 model of the Elegant brand, the unit price of which does not exceed 1,000 Hong Kong dollars. Procurement of general office furniture by the departments concerned must conform to the guidelines set out in the user guide on standard office furniture issued by the government property agency. Given the fact that the actual operation needs of the police reporting centers and control points are different from those of general offices, departments may procure chairs with specifications and functions different from those for use in general offices to meet their operational needs in accordance with the procedures laid down in the SPR. The Hong Kong Police Force's 999 reporting centers operate round the clock. It is often the case that each duty officer has to operate more than one computer terminal at any one time. The chairs must be safe, durable and ergonomically designed so as to minimize occupational safety and health risks that may arise from long hours of work that demand intense concentration and also to maintain efficiency and quality of service. The Immigration Department has also provided its counter staff with chairs tailor-made to fit counters of various sizes at different uh, control points that suit actual operational needs and which uh, comply with the requirements on occupational safety and health. As the actual operational needs vary from department to department, different factors have to be taken into account in the procurement of chairs. B. In arranging for procurement of stores, government departments have to consider factors such as the operational needs, functions of goods, maintenance requirements, greener legal requirements, cost effectiveness, and market competition with a view to drawing up specifications for goods to be purchased and ensuring that the goods purchased are value for money and public funds are well spent. C. Under the government procurement policy, irrespective of the amount involved, all controlling officers have to ensure that stores and services procured are value for money and public funds are well spent. Approving officers for such procurement have to ensure that the procurement requirements are reasonable and meet the actual operational needs of the departments. All procurement decisions made by a department must be properly justified and documented for future checking. Departments should also ensure officers responsible for procuring matters observe the financial limits set out in the SPR strictly and do not evade the financial limits by dividing procurement requirements into installments. As and when necessary, the controlling officers or COs will assign an internal audit team to check the procurement records of their respective sections units to ensure the procurements are in compliance with the SPR. The Audit Commission and the GLD have also put in place monitoring mechanisms for checking procurement records of all departments. Mr. Raymond Chen Chi Chin, last month I asked a written question to ask about the super luxurious chairs in the CS4A's office, and it was replied to by the CS4A. But then today, I'm asking a question about the police force, but then only Mr. Chen Ka Kung is answering the question. So I can say the police force has not answered my first question. My question was, the details of the chairs currently used by the staff of reporting centers and counter staff, I was asking for unit prices, but the question evaded the main points. In the immigration department, uh, you say 600 chairs, 
none of them exceed one thousand dollars. But in the nine 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 reporting centers, there are two hundred and forty chairs, and you give me only an average price, which is four thousand three hundred dollars. How many of them exceed ten thousand dollars? How expensive is the most expensive one? You have not answered the question. The police force. Uh, with regard to our questions, even at the finance committee, have always evaded our questions, uh, have ducked, uh, ducked our questions, and it is making use of st statistical tricks to evade our monitoring. You are not giving us um, figures of the same kind, so there is no way to make a comparison. Mr. Raymond Chan, please do not make criticisms. Please ask your supplementary. My question is: You have always mentioned the principle of value for money. That means. If it is worth a hundred thousand dollars, but it sells for fifty thousand dollars, and is already value for money. But Hong Kong people and we here would like to know that in the procurement of、um, such goods, do you go by the principle of frugality, and whether you seek to save public money? And is the question answered in the negative、uh, because you can spend fifty thousand dollars for a chair costing a hundred thousand dollars? Mr. Secretary, actually, in the main reply, I have already said that.、Um, say the member asked about the police forces 999 reporting centres and what chairs are used. Actually, the、um, operational needs have been considered in making the purchase. Of course, when furniture is purchased, we need to. Go for value for money, and they must comply with the SPR. And normally, as I said, the furniture will have to follow the SPR. But then, if it is non-standard furniture, then you have to look at the actual operational needs. Mr. Albert Chan, Mr. President, I like to ask the secretary. About whether the administration treats civil servants reasonably and equally, there is the SPR governing the buying of furniture. But how is implementation monitored? In your reply, the immigration department has purchased chairs, the average price of which does not exceed one thousand Hong Kong dollars. Immigration staff are also human beings. Why is it that the chairs they use? Are so much cheaper than those used by the police force. Is it that you condone the police force's abuse of public funds, or are you being mean to immigration staff because they also work very hard for long hours? They also have to sit on chairs when they work. Why is it that immigration staff are enslaved?、Uh, why are they exploited or deprived? Can you explain? When you make future policies, will you make sure that the police force will not be the one having、uh, the best treatment? It's just like Andy Zhang, who is always abusing his power. I,、uh, Mr. Chen, I think you have already asked your supplementary, Mr. Secretary, Chairman. Indeed, departments have to look at the actual operational needs in purchasing non-standard furniture. If we only have a uniform mechanism to say only standard furniture can be purchased, then we may not be meeting the actual operational needs. As for the SPR and the user guide, I already said that government departments have to go for value for money and make sure that public funds are well spent. Since non-standard furniture. Comes in different specifications and have different functions. The price difference can be great. We believe the decision should be done by made by departments according to their actual operational needs. As I said in my main reply, they have to keep detailed records, and there are audit mechanisms to make sure that they follow the guides. He has not ans answered my question. Please. Repeat your supplementary. I have talked about the price difference between one thousand dollars and over four thousand dollars. Have you reviewed the standards and guides, and have you looked at the situation as to whether there has been any deprivation of immigration department staff who have been、uh, given a mean treatment because the price difference is over four hundred percent? Secretary, as I said, is 
difficult to just look at the prices because departments look at their actual operational needs to make decisions of purchases. Uh, we believe the SPR and user guides will make sure the departments are already uh, spending public funds in the right way. Mr. Kwok Wai Kong, Mr. President, the administration shows concern towards OSH of civil servants and also work efficiency. We welcome that. But let us look at the actual situation. The price is different for the chairs for the police and the immigration staff. I think the most important work is ergonomics. The uh, secretary has said that the reporting center of the police operates around the clock, so the chairs have to be ergonomically designed. My question for the secretary is, uh, do you actually look at the chairs or the people? Because in the civil service, many people sit for the best part of the eight hours at work. Uh, is it that uh, if a staff member sits for how many hours out of the eight hours uh, a day, then that chair has to be ergonomically designed? So do you apply the standard to the chair or to the person using the chair? Secretary, thank you for the supplementary. In my main reply, I have explained that information shows that the Police Forces 999 reporting centres operate in such a way that the police communications officers may have to attend to more than one computer terminal at a time. So this is uh, necessitated by the work environment and the controlling officer can make a decision to purchase non-standard furniture according to the actual operational needs. Mr. Lowai Kwok. My question is when the administration purchases office furniture and other supplies. The secretary talked about the user guide and also the standards. I'd like to know whether there are green criteria for tackling uh, the purchase of such furniture and how they would be disposed of. So I believe you should go for green materials um, that make up the furniture. In part B of my main reply, I have said that when government departments procure stores, they have to look at operational needs, functions of the goods, maintenance requirements, green and legal requirements, and also cost effectiveness as well as market competition. Mr. Raymond Chen Chi Chin. Mr. President, at the beginning, I said uh, it should be more appropriate for the Secretary for Security to be answering the question. The motive for my ans asking the question, it is because there are uh, media reports saying that at the 999 reporting centers, there are over 100 chairs costing 8000 to $10,000. So I'd like you to answer the question. However, you only go for the average price of $4,300. Mr. Secretary, you're answering the question on behalf of the Secretary for Security and the Commissioner for Police. So can you answer my question? Is it that there are over 100 chairs which cost 8000 to $10,000 each? President. I just like to reiterate that, as, in I, as I said in the main reply, there are 240 chairs at the 999 reporting centers, and they cost $4,300 each on average. Should we just accept that for an answer? We are asking for the unit price. Just say so if you don't know the actual answer. Secretary, uh, shouldn't you provide the information required, requested by this member? Secretary, uh, Chairman, I think I have answered the question about the prices of the chairs. No, the member has asked whether there are expensive chairs cited by the member. Uh, he was not talking about the average price. Secretary, can you provide the answer? In the main question, uh, this is not asked in that kind of Terms. So when I prepared the reply, I did not give consideration or um, anticipate that supplementary. But I believe in the main reply, I have already answered the question. Uh, but if you need more information, I can try to provide it. I like to protest because a few weeks ago, uh, that question has been uh, submitted and uh, it is written in a very clear way. But I believe he is deliberately ducking the question. Uh, sorry, member, the secretary has already promised to provide the information after the meeting. 
Ms. An Chiang, uh, Secretary, it is right for the member to be asking this question because departments are f um, floundering uh, money. And I believe uh, this is well known um, amongst the community. Actually, the Corruption Perspective Index has been released not too long ago, and we have dropped one um, band. Uh, we are ranked 15 around the world, and this is uh, the lowest so far. So I'd like to know whether there is a decline in clean government. And if that's the case, I believe uh, actual reform measures should be taken so as to improve the uh, use of public funds. Sorry, Ms. An Chiang, I believe the material you are reading out is not related to the main question. Please ask your supplementary. Secretary, will you consider stepping up the monitoring system? Secretary. President, uh, I thank the member for this supplementary. Actually, the administration puts a puts a lot of stall by whether departments follow the SPR in the purchase of stores. In the monitoring uh, procedure, there are many monitoring mechanisms, as I said, through the GLD and the Audit Commission. Uh, there is independent audit done. The GLD regularly sample checks the departments and bureaus to see whether they follow the SPR and also established procedures to do purchases, including asking for quotations from suppliers and also arranging for quotations and whether the um, officers uh, who vet the quotations are at the right rank and also whether um, anybody has been doing anything to evade the financial limits or other standards. So this regular audit um, does show that sometimes procedurally speaking um, there has been departure from such procedures from time to time. Mr. Albert Chan, President, just now Mr. Chen Chi Chin asked another supplementary but it shows that the Secretary has been fooled around by the police force or the Secretary for Security. Mr. Chan, uh, Secretary, you are in a very embarrassing situation today because you cannot answer the question of whether there are chairs costing from eight thousand to ten thousand dollars. You have been fooled around, and I believe the Secretary for Security and the police force have um, evaded uh, giving the information to you. I believe uh, this shows that you are negligent of duty, Mr. Albert Chen. I don't regard that as a genuine supplementary. The question has been used uh, has used over uh, 22 and a half minutes. We go to the next question. Question number three, Mr. Wong Kuo Heng. It has been reported that the media organization earlier collected samples of toilet paper from public toilets managed by government departments and public organizations for laboratory tests. The test results showed that the bacterial contents of all samples had exceeded the level prescribed in the relevant mainland standards. Given that some doctors have pointed out that the use of toilet paper with bacterial contents exceeding the prescribed level may cause diseases such as cystitis, the aforesaid situation has aroused concern about whether public health is at hazard. Regarding the quality of public hygiene services, will the government inform this council a whether the existing legislation has prescribed any standard on the level of bacterial contents of toilet paper, if so, of the details, if not, whether the authorities will prescribe the relevant standards so as to assess the hygienic level of toilet paper, if they will, when such standards will be implemented, if they will not, of the reasons for that, b whether it regularly collects samples of toilet paper from public toilets managed by government departments and public organizations for tests on bacterial contents, whether it has conducted studies on enhancing the design of public toilets so as to improve the hygiene conditions, if it has conducted such studies of the details, if not the reasons for that, 
of the authority's measures to step up publicity and education to raise public awareness of maintaining the hygiene of public toilets with a view to reducing the breeding and spreading of bacteria and viruses, and C, whether it has stipulated in contracts for outsourced public toilet cleansing services that contractors are required to provide toilet paper that meets hygiene standards whether it has issued guidelines to contractors regarding matters such as the storage and delivery of toilet paper. If so, of the details. If not, the reasons for that. Whether the authorities will consider switching to the direct provision by government departments of public hygiene services that are currently outsourced so as to ensure the quality of services and enhance the protection for the public. If they will, of the details, if they will not, the reasons for that. Mr. Wong, are you displaying toilet paper exceeding the prescribed level of bacterial content on in front of you? These are toilet paper which I borrowed from public toilets managed by government departments. I'd like the Food and Health Bureau to respond to that today. So I am at the... Uh, distance about two foot, uh, feet away, I suppose I won't get infected. But I see the secretary is wearing a facial mask today. I don't know whether um, he will get infected as a result. For the safety and health of members of, on, uh, in this council, would members please avoid bringing infectious materials into this council? If they do do not exceed the bacterial level, then I uh, urge the members of the public to use them. If not, then I would suggest the secretary bring these back for laboratory tests. Secretary for Food and Health. Mr. President, my reply to the question is as follows. According to the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau, Consumer goods regulated under the Consumer Goods Safety Ordinance, CAP 456, include toilet paper ordinarily sold for private use. The ordinance stipulates that consumer goods should comply with general safety requirement. The circumstances that the Customs and Excise Department as enforcement agency of the ordinance would have regard to when considering whether consumer goods comply with the requirement include the safety standards published by a Standards Institute for Consumer Goods of the Prescription, which applies to the consumer goods concern. The CNED will also seek expert advice where necessary. For toilet paper, CNED would arrange product testing with reference to mainland's national standard GB 20810-2006 and consult the Department of Health for expert advice in determining whether the general safety requirement is complied with. B. In general, contractors are required to supply clean and hygienic toilet paper under the contracts they enter into with government departments and public organizations. Some contracts require the supply of toilet paper with microorganism levels conforming to the national standard GB 20810-2006. If the toilet paper supplied by a contractor is found to be substandard, the department concerned will demand replacement provisions that conform with the requirements in the contract. Where appropriate, the department may issue warning to or impose punishment on the contractor. Individual departments have laid down in the contracts express standards for toilet paper. Where this is the case, inspection officers patrolling public toilets will check whether the toilet paper supplied complies with the standards prescribed in the contracts. The Food and Environmental Hygiene Department, FHD, monitors closely the quality of service provided by its contractors and check if they have complied with the requirements in the contract to safeguard public hygiene standards, including those pertaining to toilet paper in public toilets. FHD has made continuous effort to enhance the public toilet facilities under its management in recent years. New standards have been adopted whenever circumstances permit when planning new public toilets, reprovisioning or refurbishing existing ones, and converting aqua previs into flushing toilets. 
The new standards include installation of sensor high flushing system for water closet, cubicles, and urinal bowls, and provision of automated infrared sensor water taps and hand sanitizers to improve the environmental hygiene of public toilets. Public toilets under FEHD are cleaned two to three times a day, depending on the public demand and usage of the toilets. Toilet attendants are deployed in frequently used public toilets or those located at major tourist areas to ensure that toilets are clean and hygienic. The public may use the hotline numbers provided on notices posted in the toilets to provide suggestions. Support from civic-minded members of the public is of, of vital importance in keeping public toilets clean and hygienic. Notices appealing for public assistance in keeping toilets clean and maintaining personal hygiene are put up in public toilets. C. FHD has stipulated in the cleansing contracts that contractors must supply sufficient amount of consumables, including toilet paper, in public toilets throughout the contract period. The contracts also require contractors to provide inspection officers with samples of the relevant cleansing material for inspection and trial at least two weeks before the delivery of services. The contractors must seek prior approval from the government's representative for subsequent changes in the type of the material used. Moreover, a contractor must, within two weeks after the commencement of the contract, submit a certificate or report to the representative of the government at his own expenses to certify that the toilet paper supplied meets the microbiological standards of GB 20, uh, 20810206 or its latest edition. The certificate must be issued by an accredited laboratory. FHD will closely monitor the performance of contractors, including their compliance with the above requirements so as to ensure that toilet paper in public toilets meets the hygiene standards. In response to the recent public concern, the Government Logistics Department GLD has provided guidelines to various departments on best practices for storage and delivery on, of toilet paper. The guidelines set out ways to minimize the contamination of toilet paper by the external environment, such as using unwrapped toilet paper as soon as possible, avoiding excessive storage of toilet paper in the toilet compartments, and keeping the paper containers clean. Besides, GLD has advised relevant departments to consider, when signing new contracts with service contractors in future, requesting the contractors to supply toilet paper in individual packing. The departments concerned may also draw up their own requirements and procedures based on their operational needs so as to facilitate compliance by operational staff and service contractors. FEHD strives to provide efficient and cost-effective services to the public, which includes the provision of various environmental hygiene services through its contractors. FHG is mindful of the importance of keeping public toilets in a clean and hygienic condition. It deploys staff to inspect public toilets for ensuring that the contractors are providing the cleansing services according to the contract. If a contractor performs below the standards stipulated in the contract, FHD will take appropriate measures, including giving verbal warnings, written warnings, and default notices. Mr. Wang Kuo-heng. Mr. President. As the saying goes, uh, there are different fates for different people. However, in Hong Kong, uh, everyone can use the toilet paper supplied by government. In front of me, I have toilet paper collected in public toilets and in public markets managed by the government department. It's gray in color. This one is in CGO. It's white in color, very clear. My biggest concern is on the hygiene standards of toilet paper and the fairness in adopting standards. Now, the secretary hasn't answered me whether the rolls of toilet paper that I have brought along have exceeded the uh, prescribed microbiological level. Even in the secretary's reply, the, uh, the secretary hasn't answer whether in response to media inquiries, laboratory testing has been done to find out if the prescribed level has been exceeded. Secretary, I'd like you to answer this question. If you can't answer this now, I will give you all these uh, rolls of toilet paper after the meeting to you so that you can um, give the report of the lab testing to the panel um, on food and environmental, food safety and environmental hygiene for discussion by members. Secretary, 
as mentioned in the main reply, the various government departments, as far as procurement and consumables provided by contractors, including toilet papers, are concerned, they've set down standards for toilet paper. And there is also a requirement that two weeks before delivery of services, the contractors are required to provide samples of the relevant material for inspection by our officers. Should they be substandard, we have a penalty system in place. This is a more pragmatic approach because once the toilet paper is unwrapped, when it's exposed in the environment and after it is used by the general public, random sample sampling for lab tests would be different from the time when um, before it is used, it's given for sample lab testing. Mr. Wang, what's the question? The Secretary hasn't answered my question at all. Please repeat your question. My question is whether Secretary will, in response to media inquiries, conduct random checks and lab tests and for the issue to be followed up by the FE panel. Well, my understanding is Secretary already responded to your question on uh, lab tests. Well, Secretary, any supplement? Are you going to have any random sample checks? As I said just now, according to expert advice, for toilet paper supplied for use in public toilets after it's exposed in the environment and used by members of the public, the microbiological um, level in toilet paper might increase. Therefore, we don't recommend taking random samples from public toilets. Rather, before delivery of services and after procurement, they are required to submit samples for checks. Mr. James Tin, Mr. President, about Mr. Wong's question, the focus is, of course, on the difference in the level of microorganisms uh, in the toilet paper used in different public toilets. Now, the Secretary, has it to do with the pricing, which leads to different standards? For example, the toilet paper, um, for those in white, it's uh, it's um, more pricey for uh, grey ones, they're cheaper. Or is it the case that after exposure in the environment, in different environments, the colours change? Secretary, as I mentioned in the main reply, every time when we issue tender for procurement of materials, depending on the needs of individual departments, we stipulate in the tender document what standards are to be met for tenderous reference. Now, members have concerns over the colour. Well, unless um, there is change in colour as a result of pollution, from a um, medical point of view, I personally don't think that there is any relevance between the colour of toilet paper and the hygiene standard. Now, what uh, about the question on difference in pricing, Secretary? I believe the principle of tendering is the same. As long as they meet all the um, requirements on hygienic standards, we will normally opt for the more cost-effective um, bid. Mr. Tan Kapil. In fact, Secretary's answer hasn't responded to the point and hasn't promised for a random check to ensure quality. It says before the commencement of delivery of services, they are required to submit a certificate or report to the government. But once their contract commences, there is no random check. So 
back to question three. Will you consider, in order to assure quality, that the services be um, provided by government departments instead of outsourced contractors? Secretary, cleansing services for different departments comprises services delivered directly by government departments and, out, and by outsourced contractors. For services delivered directly by government departments, we have internal guidelines monitoring the standards. Even for outsourced services, we have a mechanism, apart from stipulating the service requirements in the contracts, to monitor the delivery of service. Depending on their circumstances and the needs, individual departments can, at their discretion, outsource uh, the services. Mr. Kwok Wai Kung, now there are registered contractors uh, or a list of registered contractors for government capital works projects. Now there is a concern over the uh, hygiene standards of toilet papers in public toilets. So will the government consider drawing up a list of registered contractors for the provision of toilet paper so that on a regular basis random checking and testing can be done according to the list and therefore the effort of uh, conducting random inspection at various spots can, uh, subsequently can be saved? Secretary. For various services, we have different approaches. For some services, we indeed have a list of contractors on the supply of toilet paper, whether we need to drop a list. I admit, I must admit, I'm not an expert. Perhaps I will consult the expert advice of the GLD uh, before I consider this further. Dr. Lawai Kwok, Mr. President. The three parts of the question uh, have actually gone beyond toilet paper. They are actually about cleansing services provided by outsourced contractors and how FHD monitor uh, and inspects their performance. Now, Mr. President, in a public toilet in Yao Ma Te, I found in the washing basin um, sy syringes. And uh, I, without touching anything, dashed out at once. It was a horrible experience. So my question is whether the government takes notes of this matter and uh, what um, monitoring has been done by the FHD secretary for public toilets managed by the FHD. Depending on the utilization rate and their locations, we implement um, monitoring in. Um, initiatives accordingly. For example, at uh, busier toilets, the they will be cleansed by our staff at least two or three times a day, and during which the staff would pay attention to um, the circumstances as mentioned by Dr. Low, and some t they would of course need to be cleansed, and they might need to uh, clean uh, the uh, toilets more than three times, and for um, toilets with um, heavier utilization, there will be on site staff. And like I said, members of the public and users should join hands in keeping the toilets clean. It's a matter of personal hygiene and environmental hygiene. Ma um, so, um, Materials to be disposed of should be discarded uh, in appropriate places. Well, Mr. Paul Chair, just now, Secretary said that once the toilet paper is unwrapped, the random lab tests uh, will not render any result that ha carry any reference uh, value. Now, I'd like to know from Secretary, according to your uh, expert opinion, to what extent should the prescribed microbiological level be 
exceeded before there is a high risk of um, contracting cystitis or has the media report exaggerated? Secretary, from my medical knowledge, I could only say that the higher the microbiological level, the higher chance the, um, the you may contract the disease. But it also depends on the kind of bacteria and it also depends on the user's habit. The toilet paper might be clean, but if you're not careful, your hand might be uh, ex uh, might be in contact with um, ex excrement. And uh, the most important thing is to wash your hands. So it depends on how you use the toilet paper. It's not just about the microbiological level. Mr. Wang Kuo Mr. President, Secretary just now hasn't answered um, one of my questions. Why is it that different users have to use different toilet paper? Why is the toilet paper supplied at the CGO of such good quality and not the case in other public toilets? I'd like the Secretary to answer this question. Maybe the CGO should also supply this kind of toilet paper. And Secretary, any uh, difference between the standards of toilet paper used at CGOs and other public toilets? Secretary, uh, first of all, I don't think there should be a standardized uh, quality um, of t toilet paper used in different places. And according to his remarks, I feel that Mr. Wong seems to be suggesting that the color is different. But I believe that uh, it's a matter of preference. Some prefer softer toilet rolls, some prefer those with more absorption power. I don't feel that the quality, I don't think the quality of to toilet paper has much to do with the color unless it's polluted. We have spent over, well, Mr. President, if the Toilet paper used at CGO is the same as that in other public toilets. Well, Mr. Wong, we should not have a debate here. If you have views on uh, Secretary's reply, please follow it up in other places. The fourth question, Mr. Yu Wen. Thank you, Mr. President. Some members of the tourism industry have pointed out that with the implementation of the individual visit scheme, there have been changes in the travel patterns of inbound tourists in recent years. It is no longer viable for Hong Kong to rely solely on traditional attractions and shopping to attract tourists to come again. And there is thus a need to integrate existing tourism resources to promote thematic tourism with special characteristics. Now, they have also pointed out that as uh, tourists concentrate mainly in tourist areas, other districts cannot share the economic benefits of tourism, and the tourism resources in such districts are also left idle. In this connection, will the government inform this council a eh, whether there are plans to make use of the distinctive tourism resources in various districts, including natural scenery, cuisine, historic buildings, temples, churches, and so on, to draw up tour routes of different themes and formulate relevant policies for development and promotion. If there are of the details, if not the reasons for that, B, as I've learned that in order to promote district-wide economic development and employment, various district councils have proposed to develop tourism projects of different themes, including economic tourism for Saigon District, the Aberdeen Tourism Project of the Southern District, the Sanya Sen Historical Trail and the Religious Trail of the Central and Western District, and so on. Whether the authorities have drawn up any long-term development plan in relation to the tourism projects put forward by various district councils, so as to support and guide various district councils in developing such projects and coordinate various district councils to conduct joint promotional activities if they have the details, if not the reasons for that, and C, and given that some members in the community have expressed the view that the Yulan Ghost Festival, which has been put on the third national list of intangible cultural heritage, ICH, 
has attracted quite a number of visitors to come here. But the organizing teams of the festival are aging, giving rise to succession problem, and there is a lack of venues for organizing such activities. Whether the authorities have assessed the tourism values of traditional fest fest festivities and related traditional handicrafts, and formulate specific pre um, preservation and support measures to deal with difficulties encountered. If they have the details, if not, the reasons for that and. Whether the authorities have plans to promote traditional festivities integrated with the elements of tourism, if they have the details, if not, the reasons for that. The Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, Mr. President, tourism is a major pillar of Hong Kong economy. The government attaches importance to development of tourism all along. The government has been partnering with the Hong Kong Tourism Board to promote Hong Kong globally as a leading international city in Asia and a world-class tourist destination. Our rich tourism resources are the main factor that drives our tourism development. And not only do we have theme parks, uh, five uh, fine wine, culinary delights, as well as mega events, but also is in investing festivities, local living and culture, historic buildings, and breathtaking natural scenery. The government has been working with the tourism sector, the HKTB, uh, the operators of tourist attractions, other related parties, including the district councils, etc., on how to utilize these resources to promote Hong Kong more effectively. Our reply to three parts of the question is as follows. Okay. Apart from the major tourist attractions, HKTB is also actively encouraging our tourists to visit and spend in different districts so as to generate greater economic benefits to Hong Kong. In recent years, the HKTB has used different channels, including the internet, social media, smartphone applications, uh, with augmented augmented reality technology, pamphlets, etc., to promote a number of thematic routes, bundling various attractions in uh, the districts. Examples include travels through time of the hen of the central and west uh, of central Shenwan, involvement of a fishing village of Shao Wan, a popular temple and a city transformed to Bong Tai Sin Kowloon City, Yunlong Peng San Heritage Trail, Fanning Long Yuk Tao Heritage Trail, etc. To further integrate the tourism resources of each district for promotion, the HKTB plans to introduce a dedicated web page to promote the various tourism offerings in the 18 districts in stages next year. The web page will feature unique attractions, buildings, local living and culture, dining delights, theme shopping streets, and special markets, etc. In addition, the HKTB launched a new tour product development scheme, NTPDS, in November 2012 to encourage travel trade to develop new themed tour. With marketing costs partly subsidized, HKTB as at the end of 2013, uh, the scheme has subsidized 12 theme tours, including Sam Shui Po Foodie Tour, which takes visitors on a local culinary journey, and the Six Senses Heritage Experience, which features a cycling tour in Yunlong and a big bowl feast in the World Village. The NT. B PDS has received positive feedback from Travel Trade and Hong Kong TB will continue to run the scheme and encourage the Travel Trade to unleash their creativity to utilize tourism resources in different districts. C B. The government has been keeping track of different district tourism projects proposed by the district councils. Having regard to the nature of these projects and interests of our tourists, we will, through the HKTB, promote them to tourists and encourage the travel trade to develop new products. From time to time, the Tourism Commission and HKTB attended upon invitations, the meetings of DCs, as well as their committees and working groups to provide advice and assistance on planning, implementation, promotion of district tourism projects. For example, the TC and HKTB participated in the planning of the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Historical Trail in the Central and Western District and have been promoting the trail through various channels since its completion. At present, the TC is carrying out improvement works with the theme of a traditional fisherman's village for the promenades of uh, both sides of the Aberdeen Harbour as well as for Abli Chow Main Street and adjacent streets. Leveraging on the improvement works, the HKTB and the Southern District Council will continue to promote the local characteristics of Aberdeen to visitors. As regards Saigon District, the TC, the AFCD, and HKTB through the HKTB's 
the Great Outdoors Hong Kong marketing platform have been working together to promote nature-based green tourism offerings in the district. C. The government completed the first territory-wide seven tangible cultural heritage ICH in Hong Kong in May 2013. The survey findings were discussed thoroughly by the ICH Advisory Committee and a draft ICH inventory of 477 items was drawn up. Out of these items, 291 of them are under the domain of social practices, rituals and festive events and 126 items under the domain of traditional craftsmanship. Taking into account the views of the community on the craft ICH inventory, the government would publish the first ICH inventory for Hong Kong in early 2014. After that, the government will devise and implement a host of conservation measures. On tourism promotion of ICH, the HKDB actively promotes to tourist traditional festivals under the third national list of intangible cultural heritage, including Chiang Chao Chao Festival, Tayo, the Tayo Boat, the Dragon Boat Water Parade, Parade, the Taihang Fire Dragon Dance, and the Yulan Ghost Festival of Hong Kong Chiu Chao Community. The HKTB promotes the first three festivals through its promotional platform and mega events. As regards the Yulan Ghost Festival, the HKTB worked with the Federation Hong Kong Chiu Chao Community Organizations this year to publicize the festival at the Argao Street Playground in Kowloon City as well as the Chinese opera performances in various districts and arranged overseas media to do the filming. The HKTB also introduced the activities of the festival to visitors staying in town through the in-room TV channel and the HKTB visitor centers. On promotional on promotion of traditional handicrafts, the HKPDS and HKDB supports the development of relevant new tourism products by travel trade. For example, in the tour, handmade in Hong Kong visitors can have a glimpse of some of the city's old-age handicrafts, such as face threading, tailoring, shoemaking, and metal tooling, with the masters uh, craftsmen showing the history of their trades. The HKTB will continue to encourage the trade to develop tourism products in this area. Thank you. Mr. Uzi Wing. Thank you, Mr. President. According to the reply of the Secretary, the administration is assisting the various districts in respect of promotion and publicity. There is no actual support. Is there any plan within the administration? Basing on the special characteristics of various districts, uh, select one or two important items, work with the districts, invest resources to improve the tourism facilities, enhance tourism content, uh, step up tourism, tourism and publicity so as to provide comprehensive support to 18 districts. The Secretary, thank you, Mr. Yu, for the question. Mr. Yu is right. Hong Kong needs pluralism in tourism development. In my briefing, uh, the HKTB and HKTC work with the trade, including creating new, uh, developing new tourism products. We provide resources uh, to the trade. We work with the trade. We also work with the dis district councils, targeting at the special characteristics of the districts and um, tourism attractions in, spe in specific districts. In promoting tourism, uh, resources are very important. The HKTB works with the district councils very closely, say for uh, promotion of cuisine. Overseas visitors may not be familiar with the local situation. They even don't even know the names of local uh, cuisine. In fact, um, the work of the HKTB in this area uh, can be uh, seen here. Say the, the name of um, a certain dish, say if you just uh, click on the website, you can see uh, how you uh, name this dish, how you call this dish. Say a wonton noodles. You can uh, hear how um, the uh, dish is called. As for the um, tourism attractions and cuisine, um, they can be further developed. Say, for example, the district councils 
uh, can uh, promote the local culture and living. Uh, they can promote uh, food. Uh, they can uh, make use of a GPS. Uh, when visitors visit um, a certain district, they will be able to know the history, the couch, local culture, and the local cuisine in that district. Um, we adopt a creative approach. Um, it, um, we can see um, the. Um, we can also uh, solicit the views of the visitors through these uh, innovative approaches. Now, he's, he has not answered my question. I asked whether the administration will choose one or two major items and work with the district councils. Uh, Mr. Yu, at the start, has already asked that. And he's right. We adopt a uh, pluralistic approach. We shouldn't just focus on one or two items. Each district can have their specific items, and we work with them. Say in Central and Western District, the Sun Yat Sen Historic, Tra uh, Historic Trail was mentioned in my reply. And as for uh, the uh, trails, in fact, um, there are various trails in various districts. And say, in terms of cuisine, in terms of culture, and heritage, there are various recommendations. Uh, um, this is to enrich the experience of our tourists in various districts. Mr. Chung Kok Pan, uh, two weeks ago, I asked a question on new industry, and I mentioned um, the fashion industry. The secretary responded positively. He said that in Sam, Sam Shui Po, there could be something. Uh, like um, the Tong Taiwan in uh, South Korea. Now, in Sam Shui Po, they have uh, the uh, Sam Shui Po uh, Foodie Tour. Mr. Yu asked whether uh, there were uh, one or two promotions that could be done. In Sam Shui Po, if the secretary is of the view that uh, fashion is an attraction, and since the HKTB is working on foodie tour, uh, can we have a um, tourism product of food and uh, fashion? I think Mr. Chong's suggestion is very um, um, good. Uh, food and fashion, uh, just like uh, wining and dining. Um, that's in, uh, I think in Sam Shui Po, that's a very good suggestion. I will bring this uh, to the relevant authorities. In maybe I'm a digre I'm digressing a bit. Uh, a bit, fashion uh, does attract a lot of visitors to Chiang Sha Wan. They go to Chiang Sha Wan, the fashion street, um, on uh, Friday. I will go to the uh, fashion foundation. Um, of, um, I think uh, this will um, fashion will attract many visitors to Hong Kong. Mr. Lam Tai Fai. Mr. President, according to data provided by the administration, in 2010, 36 million visitors. Mainland visitors accounted by uh, accounted for 26, uh, 68 percent. In 2011, 41 million, uh, 28.1 million, or 67 percent. 2012. Uh, 48 million visitors, mainland visitors, 34.9 million, or 72 percent. This year, as at the end of October, 44.5 million visitors, mainland visitors, 33.51 million, 75 percent. Um, Mr. President, the number of mainland visitors are rising, yet international visitors are declining. Hong Kong is an international city, a financial center. With regard to the declining number of international visitors, that will be detrimental to Hong Kong's image and competitiveness. Please ask your question. My question is very simple, Mr. Secretary. Um, apart from uh, your main reply with regard to promoting tourism and promoting the new uh, cruise terminal, are there new tricks, new measures to attract more international visitors to come to visit Hong Kong, do business in Hong Kong, spend in Hong Kong, so as to raise the proportion 
of international visitors and promote the development of the Hong Kong economy. Um, we can see that mainland visitors are increasing in terms of percentage. And with regard to um, visitors from North America and Europe, uh, their proportion is declining. Uh, that has reflected the change econom in the international econ uh, uh, economic scenario. Uh, the economic downturn in Europe and North America have um, affected uh, their um, willingness to go overseas. That's the result of change in the economy, in their economies. The HKTB, uh, in terms of promotion, the spending on mainland promotion only accounted for 30% of the expenses. 70% of the expenses uh, were uh, in overseas markets. The HKTB wants to attract more long-haul and short-haul visitors to Hong Kong. I have brought along some of the materials. Mr. Yu Si Wing said that we couldn't just rely on traditional uh, tourism attractions. We had to have theme uh, thematic tours. The uh, handmade in Hong Kong, uh, handicrafts in Hong Kong, uh, are very attractive to visitors. We also have new tourism attractions here. We work with the trade. Say, for example, uh, nine hours of eco-tourism. Uh, that's heritage experience, six senses heritage experience. Within nine hours, you can travel to different parts of Hong Kong. You taste local culture. Uh, that's also eco-tourism. These are features that attract overseas visitors. We also, we also have these uh, schemes, say um, um, cuisine, local, uh, local cuisine can attract a lot of visitors. Um, we work with the local people, the district councils, on diverse, diversifying our tourism attractions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lam, I have not criticized him for lack of promotion. I asked for new tricks new measures to increase the proportion of international visitors. We cannot just sit there and wait. He has not answered me. These new measures have not attracted uh, international visitors. I think the Secretary has answered your question. If not happy, you can pursue the case on other occasions. Mr. Ma Fong Kwok. Thank you, Mr. President. In uh, part three of the reply, the administration said that it has announced uh, uh, it's uh, inventory on ICH. Uh, there are more than 200 items. It said that uh, suitable um, relevant measures, conservation measures, will be implemented. Now, the conservation measures, how are they related to developing tourism? Will the administration assess what items in the inventory can be developed um, as a tourism attraction? I thank Mr. Ma for the question. With regard to the proposed inventory, you can see that the ICH inventory covers a very wide area. Some are traditional festivities, uh, some are local dialects, some are local cuisine, and even Kung Fu is an item on the ICH inventory. Concerning various uh, these various items, um, there are different ways to attract tourists. Say many visitors come to Hong Kong because of Chinese Kung Fu. Uh, th there are different promotional strategies basing on the inventory. Now, after the uh, publication of the inventory, uh, we will consider items that can attract visitors, and then we will make an assessment. We've spent uh, 22 minutes on that. The fifth question. 
Mr. Chen Kwok Chu. Thank you, Mr. President. In the 2010-2011 policy address, the government indicated that it would enhance the services provided for autistic children on aspects such as health care, education, and preschool services, including providing more information about autism to parents and carers of autistic children and expanding the professional team for relevant health care services. Besides, the government indicated in the budget released subsequently that services will be provided for an additional 3,000 or so children with autism or hyper activity disorder each year. Regarding the services provided for children, that is, persons aged under 18 with autism or hyperactivity disorder, will the government inform this council A of the respective numbers of children who are assessed for autism or hyperactivity disorder in each of the past three years, broken down by age, among such children of the respective numbers of those who were diagnosed to be the autistic children with and without intellectual disabilities, as well as those diagnosed to have hyperactivity disorder of the current number of autistic children in territory according to the authorities' estimation, B of the respective details concerning the health care, education and welfare services provided for children with autism or hyperactivity activity disorder by the authorities in the past three years and the respective waiting time for such services and see whether the targets of the health care, education and welfare services currently provided for autistic children include autistic children without intellectual disabilities. If so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Food and Health. In relation to Mr. Cheung's question, I give the following answer. A. The Department of Health provides comprehensive assessment services through its Child Assessment Service CAS, for children under 12 years of age who are suspected to have problems during their growth stage, including those with tendency for or symptoms of autism or hyperactivity disorder. After the assessment, the CS CACs. The child assessment centers will formulate follow up plans and make referrals according to the needs of individual children. In each of the past three years, the six CACs under the DH conducted assessment for over 8,000 children. Among them, the number of confirmed autism cases were between 1,600 and 1,800, and that of confirmed cases of hyperactivity disorder between 2,000 and 2,200. Of the confirmed autism cases, 900 to 1,100 children also have developmental delay or intellectual disabilities. The detailed figures are set out in the annex. As the CAS of the DH is not the only service unit to provide developmental assessment services for children in Hong Kong, the administration cannot project the total number of persons suffering from autism in Hong Kong based on the above figures. For part B and C of the uh, question. Following preliminary assessment by the CAC of the DH, children with autistic tendency or symptoms will be referred to the specialist outpatient clinics of the hospital authority for further assessment and treatment. In 2012-13, the DHA provided relevant medical services for over 6,100 children and adolescents suffering from autism and over 6,800 children and adolescents suffering from hyperactivity disorder. Autistic children with intellectual disabilities can also use the services provided for autistic children by the HA to enhance the support for children and adolescents suffering from autism or hyperactivity disorder. The HA expanded the multidisciplinary team comprising various health care practitioners in 2011-12 to 12 to provide early identification, assessment and treatment for an additional 3,000 children with autism or hyperactivity disorder each year. A professional team will provide appropriate treatment and training for autistic children in order to help them develop better speech and communication skills, improve interpersonal relationships and social skills, problem-solving skills and behavioral behavior adjustment and emotional management, so as to help them communicate and get along with others in daily life. As regards services provided by CAS of the DH, in the past three years, nearly all new cases were attended to within three weeks and assessments for over 90% of the newly registered cases were completed within six months. In 2012 to 13, the median waiting time for first appointment of each child and adolescent psychiatric services was about 19 weeks. On education support services, 
autistic students with intellectual disabilities will attend schools for children with intellectual disabilities for intensive support, while other students with autism or hyperactivity disorder but are of average intelligence will attend ordinary schools. To help ordinary primary and secondary schools cater for students with special educational needs (SEN), including students with autism and hyperactivity disorder, the Education Bureau has been providing additional services on top of the regular surveillance professional support and teacher training for schools, and encouraging schools to adopt the three-tier intervention model to support students with SEN. Schools may flexibly deploy resources to employ additional teaching staff and or procure professional services to render appropriate support for the students. In addition, since the 2011-12 school year, the EDB has launched a pilot project on the enhancement of support services for students with autism in ordinary primary and secondary schools, which comprises structured on top small group training for students with autism. The EDB also published the development of executive skills resource package in 2009-10 to school year for primary schools to strengthen the executive skills of students with hyperactivity disorder through school-based group training program. Should students with autism or hyperactivity disorder still exhibit severe emotional and behavioral problems despite the school-based remedial support, schools may, upon parental consent, refer the students to the adjustment unit of the EDB for pull-out intensive intervention. For those students who do not show significant improvement after receiving support, the EDB will consider providing schools with a time-limited grant to employ teacher assistance to provide individualized support in in order to help the students concerned to establish classroom routines. On the welfare front, the government has strived to provide children with birth uh, from birth to six years old with disabilities or at risk of becoming disabled with early intervention through preschool rehabilitation services with a view to enhancing the physical, psychological, and social developments, thus improving the chances of studying in ordinary schools and participating in daily life activities and helping their families meet their special needs. The early education training centers, the special child care centers, and the integrated program in kindergarten come child care centers of the social welfare department provide training for children with disabilities including those diagnosed with autism and hyperactivity disorder. There are currently a total of 6,245 preschool rehabilitation places. SWD anticipates that about 607 additional places will come on stream in 2013-14. to 14. The waiting time for SWD's preschool services in 2010-11, to 2011-12, to and 2012-13 to are 10 to 15 months, 12 to 17 months, and 13 to 17 months, respectively. Meanwhile, the Community Care Fund has launched an assistance program on training subsidy for children who are on the waiting list of subvented preschool rehabilitation services since December 2011 to provide training subsidy at a maximum of $2,615 per month for preschool children, including those with autism and hyperactivity disorder from low-income families who are in need of rehabilitation services, thereby enabling them to receive self-financing services operated by non-governmental organizations and facilitating the learning and development. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Peter Chow. Thank you, Mr. President. Early identification and early intervention will be important for the children and um, young people involved. Now, my question straddles across three bureaus. Now, we have only got the director of the uh, Best Performing Bureau because they are involved in early intervention and identification. But what about the Education Bureau and the Labor and Welfare Bureau? Now, for the Labor and Welfare Bureau, the earliest, uh, the shortest waiting time will be 17 months to get preschool rehab service. So by that time, this child would have been admitted to P1. Now, $10,000 per child will be given to a school. And in this case, um, the Education Bureau may think that um, that will be the end of the matter, but in fact, this is not adequate. Uh, Dr. Ko, I'm sorry you are the only director of bureau here, but still you have to answer the question. In your main reply, you have said that there is a multidisciplinary team comprising healthcare professionals. Is it possible to have a multidisciplinary and interdepartmental team so as to study 
the possibility of having one-stop service after identification, and then there should be uh, preschool education and then primary education. I hope that the child involved will get all the services needed. And then for manpower and other things, then I think with such a mechanism, there will be better follow-up. So, Secretary, is it possible for you to give such a pledge? Secretary, I agree with Mr. Zhang. That is, for us to provide the services, the most ideal arrangement is to provide one-stop service. That is, at a very young age, there will be early identification, and then preschool, at school, and preschool, the child or the person involved will be given adequate support. For this model, as to how we can design such a model and how we can get the resources to support it, and of course, we have to be able to forecast the manpower requirement in terms of paramedical staff as well as uh, other professional staff. It will be a uh, huge issue. Therefore, we have already set up uh, a working group to review psychiatric health or mental health. And in fact, under that, we have also got a professional um, or an expert experts working group on child and uh, adolescent mental health. And we are concerned about the issue that you've referred to for children uh, who have been diagnosed with autism or hyperactivity disorder for their problems. We hope that in the future we can come up with a good model so that in terms of operation, it can provide one-stop service. I agree that it is not an easy task, and I believe that for this expert group, they will certainly make reference to the overseas practices to see what sort of models will be of use of reference value to Hong Kong and what problems have been experienced in other models. And then under the Review Committee on Mental Health, in fact, in a few days' time, we're going to hold a meeting. And I understand that at that meeting, the expert group on child and adolescent mental health will give a report, giving us a picture about the current level of services. By examining what we have got, then we will see what inadequacies there are in the current service and then we'll make reference to overseas models. And after that, we hope that the experts can come up with constructive recommendations guiding us as to what we should do and how we should develop the service in the coming few years. Mr. Yu Kin Yun, Mr. President, I'm not sure whether the Secretary can answer this question on behalf of the SWD. In the Secretary's reply, mention is made that between uh, in the year 2012-2013 for preschool rehab service, on average, the waiting time is between 13 and 17 months. I think the waiting time is getting longer and longer. After assessment and diagnosis, you have to wait for 12 or up to 18 months' time before you get rehabilitation service, that it means that it is no longer preschool. The child will be ready for um, primary education. I want to know why it is so difficult to shorten the waiting time. Is there a way to improve it, Secretary? Well, on the face of it, the impression you get is that the capacity of delivering service vis-à-vis -vis the number of children requiring the service, there is a gap, and that's why we need a waiting time. There is a queue. All along, the SWD is concerned about preschool rehabilitation services and is concerned about the waiting time. We are making best use of the resources to make sure that the needy children will get the training. In 2006, the SWD already uh, simplified the procedures, stepped up the IT system, and introduced measures to prevent overlapping or duplicate um, uh, waiting um, uh, cases. Between 0708 and 2012-13, 1,400 more 
uh, places have been introduced. There is an increase of 30 percent. In the coming year, we believe that there will be an additional 607 places. And then we know that some children are still waiting for their turn. And therefore, in 2011, month of December, the Community Care Fund has launched a program called Training Subsidy for Children who are on the waiting list of Subvented Preschool Rehabilitation Services. The purpose is to help children from low-income families who are in need of rehab services so that they have get they they can get 12 months uh, training to help them with their development. The SWD is the executive arm for each child on a monthly basis. The most they can get will be $2,615, and then they will get no more, less than uh, four lessons of training, uh, speech therapies, OTs, and PTs can also provide uh, no less than three hours of training or treatment. And then we have also got psychologists and social workers uh, providing family support service. Um, as a result of the effectiveness of such a program, um, the CCF will extend it to March 2014. And then we are going, we are receiving a new round of applications. And the administration is considering the idea of making it a recurrent program. Mr. Lang Yu-Chong, unfortunately, we haven't got the Secretary for Education. I forget education-related question. In the main reply, the SFH has said that to help ordinary primary and secondary schools, um, the schools may flexibly deploy resources to employ additional teaching staff and or procure professional services. For each child with SEN, you get ten to $20,000 each. For some schools, uh, they will be very um, dedicated, and yet they haven't got sufficient money to acquire the professional services. In some cases, the school just don't spend a cent out of it and just return it to the Education Bureau. In other words, the SEN students don't get the help that they need. So I want to know whether there will be an overall review as to the mode of subvention for the acquisition of professional services. Uh, will there be a review to check whether it is uh, effective? If not, would you consider finding a way to help? Uh, because in this way, the students with SCN will not benefit and it will be meaningless. Please uh, let the Secretary answer your question. Sorry. I think Mr. Leung was referring to an ordinary school and later on he was referring to a special school. Which schools? not special schools, SCN, students with special educational needs in ordinary schools. They are being given subvention subsidies from the Education Bureau, getting ten to $20,000 each. Uh, I think the Secretary is clear about this. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Leung. I think Mr. Leung is talking about the pilot scheme, so that in on top of the regular program, there is an additional um, help, so um, covering 10% of the autistic children. Yes, I agree that we need to examine the effectiveness of the program, and the Education Bureau will monitor the performance, and then uh, schools may also um, make recommendations. And in fact, uh, we have at least two meetings per year concerning quality assurance. There is a meeting between the administration and the service providers. Moreover, the Education Bureau on a yearly basis will, together with the major stakeholders, uh, carry out a survey uh, for the purpose of monitoring. But then if Mr. Leung is concerned about the overall um, service, in fact, earlier on when I answered the questions asked by other members, I've already pointed out that uh, it should ideally cover all aspects, starting from diagnosis, 
assessment, preschool, and then um, when a child goes to school, either at a special school or an ordinary school, I think all such stages should be covered. Just now, I talked about the review committee on mental health, and there is an expert group under it on child and adolescent mental health. I'm sure uh, this should also be examined as these struggles across different departments and bureaus. And I think uh, we need to look at the quality of the service, and we should identify the inadequacies. And then um, the expert group should come up with some recommendations for us. For our mental health uh, committee, uh, review committee, we have got the relevant uh, representatives from the different departments and bureaus. Maybe uh, the secretary um, misunderstood my question. I'm not, I'm not talking about autistic students alone, but students with SEM. There is a subsidy from the Education Bureau. Unfortunately, some schools would not spend the money. They would just return the subsidy to the Education Bureau. In other words, there isn't any special service to help the students. Please let the Secretary answer the question. Of course, I may not be fully aware of the information that Mr. Leung referred to, but I will still be giving an answer in such a direction as to whether the money given to schools uh, have been spent and would it be effective, then of course it should be subject to monitoring, and indeed there is monitoring. However, if you talk about um, cross-disciplinary um, um, services, I think we should uh, entrust the task with the review committee and the expert group. Mr. Fernando Zhang, for children with autism, and hyperactivity disorder, they will be referred to the psychiatric department of the HA for assessment and treatment. It is said that the um, median waiting time is 19 weeks. I've got this with me. Well, in fact, this is a photograph. It is a notice showing that the waiting time will take you until October 2015 for new cases. In other words, a full two years' time to wait. So for this group of children, you are asking them to wait for two years before they get to see a doctor. So can you call this early intervention? Secretary, I admit I agree that under the HA, including the service that you referred to. I think there are um, inadequacies in terms of the unsatisfactory waiting time. Uh, the HA, within the resources available and with the manpower available, is working hard to improve the service and tries to cut short the waiting time. When we appointed the new chairman to the HA, we did talk to the new chairman of the HA. We said that we should be dealing with specialties one by one to find out which has got exceptionally long waiting time and try to find out whether we can uh, streamline the procedures so as to cut short the waiting time. If you talk about uh, resources across the board, we have a manpower shortage. So probably after the review, then we have to plan what we can do in terms of training at this following stage so that the medical professionals and their paramedical professionals will be in adequate supply so that we can improve our service. Uh, we'll spend over 24 minutes on this question. Last question seeking an oral reply, Mr. Tommy Chung. Thank you, Mr. President. In 2005, the Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department, AFCD, introduced the Accredited Fish Farm Scheme to enhance the quality of local fish products and set up a product quality assurance system so as to increase the competitiveness of such products. Moreover, to promote the sustainable development of the local aquaculture industry, the AFCD has from time to time introduced new species of fish from abroad for culturing by fish farmers. 
For example, the organic jade perch brought in from Australia and promoted comprehensively in 2011. It has been reported that despite a growing interest of the public in fish products from accredited fish farms and aquatic products cultured by organic aquaculture, the retail outlets of these fish products are mainly located in large supermarkets. Regarding the channels and situation of the sale of locally cultured fish products, will the government inform this council? First, whether it knows the number of retail outlets selling certified organic fish products in public markets in Hong Kong in each of the past three years. If such retail outlets are few in number of the reasons for that, and whether it has planned to increase the number of such retail outlets to make such fish products more accessible to the public. If it has, of the details. If not, the reasons for that. And second, whether it knows the respective annual production and sales volume of jade perch so far, whether it has assessed if the sale was satisfactory, and whether culturing jade perch in accredited fish farms was profitable, if it was not profitable of the reasons for that. Secretary for Food and Health. Mr. President, organic aquaculture generally refers to the organic cultivation of aquatic animals in natural or artificial water bodies. In 2009, the Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department, the AFCD, started to explore organic aquaculture and lay down a code of practice for organic aquaculture in collaboration with the Hong Kong Organic Resource Center in the same year. The organic aquaculture standard comprises a strict code of practice on management, which covers areas such as the aquaculture environment, sources of fish fry, choice of feed, stocking density, routine husbandry practices, fish health management, and the process of transport and slaughtering. Organic aquaculture values the importance of ecologic balance and animal welfare, avoids using synthetic chemical fish medicine, and requires strictly the use of fish feed that have been independently certified to be organic. To promote organic aquaculture, the AFCD assists fish farmers in acquiring accreditation for their organic aquatic products, carries out regular inspection of fish farms and water quality monitoring, and provides support in culture techniques. In addition, the AFCD has been working closely with a fish marketing organization, the FMO, in promoting the sale of organic aquatic products, including setting up promotion booths in supermarkets, and showcasing organic aquatic products in the farm fest. My reply to the various parts of the question is as follows. First, two retail outlets are selling certified organic fish products in public markets in Hong Kong. They are located in Taikyo Market and Tung Yik Market in Yunlong and started business in March 2011 and September 2012 respectively. Both retail outlets are directly run by organic fish farmers. In total, there are 27 organic product sales outlets for local organic fish in Hong Kong. Of them, 17 obtain supply direct from an organic fish farm. The remaining 10 sales outlets obtain supply from the FMO, which sources the products from orga organic fish farms. Organic certification bodies have laid down the requirements for handling organic products. Under such requirements, organic fish must be slaughtered and processed in a certified organic product processing center and individually packed and labeled as certified organic products. Certified organic fish products must also be stored separately from non-organic products in the course of delivery and sale. Not only will these requirements protect the products from contamination, they also facilitate the identification of genuine organic products by consumers. Fishmongers must be equipped with the necessary supporting facilities and comply with the relevant requirements which, when selling organic fish. The organic aquaculture market in Hong Kong is at an early stage of development. As the production of organic fish is limited in scale, it is difficult for ordinary fishmongers in markets to secure adequate supply for maintaining a retail outlets. Only fresh fish shops directly run by operators of organic fish farms could ensure steady and sufficient supply. 
These fish farms have set up their own organic aquatic product processing center for providing supply to their own retail outlets direct. In recent years, the FMO has been striving to increase the number of retail outlets for organic fish. Currently, organic fish products are processed in the accredited processing center of the FMO and then distributed to supermarkets and organic product shops for sale. The FMO is also extending the distribution network for organic fish to retail outlets of organic products in various districts and organic farms markets across the territory. With limited production, organic fish products are often out of stock in different retail outlets. Even when the supply of organic fish increases in the future, consideration may be given to extending the supplies to ordinary markets. Second part of the question. Local organic aquatic products have been put on the market since 2011. In 2011 and 2012, the production volume was 8 tons and 18 tons, respectively. It's estimated that the production would reach 20 tons in 2011, 2013. There's healthy demand from the public for organic jade perch, which are often sold out shortly after they're put on the market. According to the feedback received by AFCD, It is the conservative estimate of fish farmers that the profit from organic fish farming exceeds that of conventional fish farming by 10%. The total water surface area for organic fish farming has increased from 20,163 square meters in 2011 to 51,819 square meters in 2013, an increase of 160%. Organic fish farming has its fair measure of attraction from the business perspective, yet the cap- capital outlay and technical inputs that it takes to pursue organic fish farming are more intensive than that for traditional fish farming. Hence, many fish farmers are still adopting a cautious attitude towards the prospect of its future. According to AFCD, the operators of about 15 fish ponds are seeking to start or switch to organic farming, including fish farmers who newly joined the business and existing organic fish farmers which, who wish to expand their operations. Mr. Tommy Chow. We're pleased to see the second part of the reply, that is, the government will assist in promotion. However, SFH has actually not answered my question. Starting from fresh beef and chewed beef, back then the government only asked the supermarkets to do it. It's a failure. Up to now, we still don't have chewed beef. Sorry, Mr. President, I can't hear Mr. Tommy Chung. Is it better now? Sorry. Starting from chewed beef, which was passed to the supermarkets for business, was a failure. Now, this jade perch is a success. But I've received complaints from the operators of fresh fish stores that they're out of stock. In point number one of the reply, it said that some of the jade fish was actually bought by the FMO from the fish farms and then distributed to retail outlets, including the supermarkets. I'd like to ask the SFH whether the government should not be lopsided towards the major supermarkets. There shouldn't be differential treatment for the smaller fish stores in the market. They shouldn't be exploited. They should also have the opportunity to sell these organic fish products. SFH, Mr. President, I agree with Mr. Tommy Chung that if organic fish products are becoming more and more popular, we should extend them to more retail outlets. And of course, including wet market retail outlets beyond supermarkets. But as I said in my main reply, for organic fish, even before aquaculture, sources of fish fry, choice of feed, etc., we have very strict requirements. And in terms of delivery and sales, we also have requirements. I believe why, at the beginning, we made use of supermarkets to do promotion. I believe there were reasons for that. If we can enhance production 
And if members of the public accept organic fish more and more, we should extend retail outlets to those retail outlets in wet markets. In the next stage, uh, the AFCD will work hard towards that direction. Mr. Albert Ho, thank you, Mr. President. I'd also like to thank Mr. Tommy Chung for asking this question. I'd also like to thank the egg and fish sector for this jade perch. Mr. Stephen Ho, well, we do have a certain species, certain species of fish being cultured. I'd like to ask the SFH this. Our organic fish farmers face the sea migratory birds which continuously eat their fish and their hands tied. They have no solutions. They adopted certain practices which are banned under the ordinance and some methods were ineffective, thus dealing a heavy blow to these fish farmers. So the administration should consider long-term strategies to protect the livelihood of the fish farmers. Then in the long run, as Mr. Tommy Chung said, good products could be passed to members of the public. SFH, Mr. President, I have to declare interest first. As a bird watcher, I'd like to find ways and means to take care of the interests on both sides. On the one hand, we would like to protect the fish farmers. Of course, I'm not talking about organic fish farmers as only. We would like to protect all fish farmers such that they won't sustain economic losses. At the same time, we would like to safeguard our fish catch such that fishies won't be eaten by birds. Certain measures adopted might have affected the migratory birds. According to what Mr. Leung told us, not all nets are banned. Some nets will not catch migratory birds and they can be used. For the fish farmers, if they don't know which nets can be used, if they have technical inquiries, they can ask the AFCD, which will provide technical support, and the AFC will be, AFCD will be very willing to do so. And there are other methods to guard against the birds, and you don't need to use nets like reflective materials or noises, which will scare birds away, and fish farmers can consider these methods. Mr. Frankie Yick. Mr. President, just now I heard the SFH say that he also supported the organic fish farming industry. I'd also like to ask about point one of the main reply. For consumers to easily identify the organic fish products, certain requirements and processes have to be observed. But in wet markets, they're mainly small businesses. Will the SFH consider certain measures to assist these hawkers such that they can have some pre-business investment, such that when they conduct their businesses, members of the public will be able to get these organic fish products, for example, by offering interest-free or low-interest loans? SFH, Mr. President, if we are to extend the sale of organic fish products to the wet markets, then as the Honourable Member mentioned, some operators in wet markets may face investment difficulties as well as space restriction. I won't go into the details. Overall speaking, there are two aspects. Technically, the AFCD and the FEHD, where and when necessary, will provide technical assistance or guidance. At the same time, for investment, we can consider certain measures. Here, I cannot say for certain whether this is possible. Later, we'll launch, well, the CEO will mention in his policy address, a sustainable fisheries fund. At the moment, we also have a fund 
in existence. Whether or not、uh, these two funds can cover organic fish farmers and the retail outlets, I don't know. But we'll look into the details of these two funds and see whether there are other loan requirements. Mr. Michael Tian, Mr. President, new. People Party met the CE this morning to present to him our views about the policy address, and then we mentioned this again fish industry. Just now, the <coughs> SFH slightly mentioned this to introduce high tech to assist with the aquaculture of organic fish products is good, and later we can have better chicken fries. To assist local chicken farmers to reduce chicken import for organic fish and poultry, there's huge demand in the market, and we do have quality assurance. The mainland is a big market. They believe Hong Kong's brands, so we have two markets in total. Just now, when the SFH answered Mr. Frankie Yick's question, I talked to. The industry, and they told me that it's difficult for them to find land sites, and they need water sources, etc., etc. Well, Mr. Tan, don't be too long-winded. Please ask your question. Well, the SFH mentioned、uh, the funds to assist in investment. What about land, water, electricity, or even technical support? Will you consider them? SFH. Mr. President, a simple and direct reply is that we'll try as far as possible to consider all aspects, but land is a bit difficult to find land sites for aquaculture. Well, basically, fish existing fish ponds are one of our choices. Maybe we can consider deserted fish ponds. That's one way out. But of course, it may not be organic fish farming. But for fish farming as a whole, we did report to the relevant electrical panel that we reviewed the existing situation of aquaculture in selected areas. Will reissue licenses for aquaculture, so we're very concerned about、uh, the development of the fishing industry. So, wherein, when appropriate, we'll offer assistance. Mr. Lang Chi Chang, Mr. President, all along, organic products are popular among members of the public in recent years. Given the hard work and promotion of the FCD, jade perch had become a recognised popular fish. But in terms of promotion and publicity, I believe we need to work harder. At the district level, we don't see government promotion of organic products. In all the eighteen districts, will organic fish markets、uh, be established to lead the development of organic products? We very much support the suggestion on promotion. As I said in my main reply, the AFCD every now and then promote.、Uh, Local organic agriculture and aquatic products in farm fest, and in department stores and supermarkets, advertisement stores have been established to assist in promotion. Just now, the honourable member asked about promotion. Public acceptability and demand have been growing. But then there is a problem because、uh, the production volumes have not been able to meet demand. 
So we have to strike a balance. If our production cannot catch up with demand, then even if we do promotion, probably the pace of promotion should match our production capacity. As for promotion in all the 18 districts, the suggestion is good, but each district has its different demands. So when we have the capacity to boost production, we'll try to consider this suggestion as far as possible. Dr. Lo Wai Kok, well, Jade Perch is an example. But recently, there are media reports that another species of fish had been captured in our uh, so-called fish factories and have attained success. So innovation is worthy of our support. Has the administration conducted studies in various industries? So I'm talking about comprehensive policies on our industries. SFH, there's a direct answer to this question. Very soon, we'll apply to the LegCo for $500 million for the Fisheries Development Fund, and R&D will be covered. Mr. Polder, in the first part of the reply, it is said that at present we have 27 sales outlets, and 17 have obtained supply directly from the farms, and 10 obtain supply from the FMO, which sources products from organic fish farms. How were those 10 selected? Will there be differential treatment? SFH? Well, there won't be differential treatment. We open up opportunities to all organic fish farms. Do you have any criteria? For criteria, I'll supplement my answer in writing to Mr. Paulsey after the meeting.